Michael Thompson Part 2. Michael Thompson was a leader of the AB back in the day when it was at its inception in the 70s. He ended up serving 45 years in prison. He was shot 22 times. His video that we put up last week has already just smashed over 200,000 views, one of the most viral we've ever had on the channel. And we have been inundated with demands to get Michael back on. We've been inundated with questions for him. And he has been so generous with his time to come back on so soon. So huge thank you, Mike, for coming back. My pleasure, Sean. All right, so we are now live then on all of the various platforms. People are going to start putting questions on the screen. But I am going to just give you some of the questions that have come in beforehand to start with. So the first okay. question is, who carved the Swazi tattoo on Charles Manson's head? Well, Charlie himself did that the, in the mirror. Didn't do a very good job of it either. <laughs> but, uh, he did it nonetheless and he actually did it with a um, a staple um, and did he do it to be affiliated with AB no no he, he did it more um, in protest of course I mean there are a lot of theories relative to why he did it and, and I've heard um, many a pundit weigh in you know relative to that but um, if you look at it, it's really just a sun wheel as opposed to a swastika. And there's a vast distinction between um, a sun wheel and a swastika and what it represents. So it, it, in, his con in the context in which he used it, it was uh, to represent movement. All right, we just got one that come up in the chat here from Heisen Blue. You received... Um... Do most people accept you and the way you have changed your life since your release? It depends on who you ask. You know, when you say most people, it would be mm, within which community? Um, you know, if you're talking about the organized crime community, not likely. Um, I'm at loggerheads with uh, the vast majority of the organized crime community. And, um, you know, what I strive for there is simply just a, a mutual respect. Uh, and we have that pretty much established. You have some who will deviate from that for their own purposes, but uh, I don't mind. I, I, as I've said before, I, I believe in free speech. Next question from the live chat is from Guitar Storms. Are the Aryan Brotherhood still as strong as they ever were? I think actually stronger. Um, they, um, since they've gone national, uh, They've acquired um, a lot more members. Uh, some of your groups, like uh, the Texas AB, is paramilitary, extremely strong, and a force to be reckoned with. And then as you move around into the country, you find uh, some strongholds, some not as strong. Um, here in California, um, I would say that they're actually stronger than they used to be uh, because they've opened up the shoe units, actually closed them down, and so those members that were confined to the shoe have now been released to um, main lines. And so that gives them more movement and more access to their resources. And um, so, yeah, to answer the question, I would say strong. Mike, would you say that the growth of the prison population in the U.S. has made the AB stronger because they've got a far greater pool of potential members and that it just extends out into the community? Yeah, what it does is it enhances the resource availability. And because of that, you're able to generate more revenues, um, access more individuals by way of associates and otherwise. And the brand has always been big on the utilization of resources, associates on the street and inside. Um, so yeah, it's, it's made a huge difference. So thanks for the super chat, have a camp. And the question is, your thoughts on today's wannabe gangsters? Hmm. Well, there seems to be a lot of them, <laughs> first and foremost. And, uh, you know, again, um, I think we're all seeking as human beings uh, some sense of uh, relationship as well as identity. And oftentimes we align ourselves with a specific group for specific reasons. 
And, um, you know, that's designer specific. Some may take the position that one size fits all. And oftentimes you'll find that your groups, depending on who they are, adhere to that dictum. Um, but, um, you know, the idea of a gangster, I don't fancy myself a gangster, never have. Um, so I understand the idea of, you know, OG and, you know, I've been called uh, triple OG, but um, um, I really have never fancied myself a gangster at all. I've got one here that came in before the chat from Cliff Gallon, one of the YouTube viewers. Will mm. you please describe T.D. Bingham or Barry Mills in terms of personality? And perhaps for the UK viewers, Mike, who are not familiar with those names, could you explain who they are? Yeah, T.D. Bingham is probably, well, first, Baron Mills has passed over. Um I think last year, but T.D. Bingham is still alive. Perhaps the most influential member of the Aryan Brotherhood. He's currently incarcerated within the federal system. Um, I met T.D. back in the early 70s. He was the one who initially attempted to recruit me into the brand, and I declined. But um, nonetheless, um, I liked him. I still like him. Um, he's what we refer to as a man's man. He's extremely intelligent, um, a thoughtful man, um, a poet, um, well-read, and um, a force to be reckoned with. They don't call him the Hulk for nothing, um, even in his 70s. So, um, Baron, uh, I think, was a completely different personality. Um, not as well-trained, not as well-disciplined, and certainly not as well-mannered as TD is. Okay, so next question, we've got it from Havacamp. How long did it take you to get used to today's world after getting released? I don't know that I'm used to it yet. Um, you know, I was released in 2019, but uh, one of the things I didn't anticipate was the post-traumatic stress disorder associated with having been uh, uh, confined to a cage for 45 years. Um, they released me right in the center of East LA. You know, in the first week I was in, I had to go through a um, um, transitional housing facility, Beacon House. It's run by Amity in Los Angeles. Great organization. But um, the first week I was there, just around the corner, within that week, three individuals were shot in the head. Um, the next week, an individual was stabbed to death out in front of the house. So, and um, way too many people. So my biggest problem in being released and continues to be my problem is what's referred to as sensory overload. So, and that's astronomical. Uh, the idea of uh, contending with, um, you know, on, on a prison yard, you walk out into the yard and your mind has a virtual reality. So you walk out into the yard and you know where everything is at. And so you don't have to adjust to that. When you're released after 45 years of being in a cage, you know, the whole world. I'll, I'll give you just a brief example. Um, a friend of mine took me to the beach. I wanted to touch the water. And um, I'm water clan. So um, we couldn't get to the beach. There were so many people. We actually had to walk out on the pier. And I turned around and I looked back towards the, um, the mainland and it looked like an ant colony um, of people and houses. And um, I just wasn't prepared for that. And so, you know, I had to learn how to drive all over again. Um, and, um, you know, it's one of the things I think that needs to be addressed. That very idea of people being released back out into society and not being prepared for it. Even with all my preparation, uh, I was not prepared for it. So Britt Pat would like to know which group in jail is the most feared and which group tends to have the best fighters in it? I think that's going to be tricky to answer because what I noticed was the group with the biggest numbers usually picks on the groups with the least numbers and that changes over time. So it depends which prison you were in, which state you're in, you know, who, who, where those numbers were comprised from, really. Yeah, you're right. It, it um, Particularly with all the prisons that you have now. So you have a multitude of groups and, and they have their own special categories. Um, the Department of Corrections does that now. So, and again, it goes back to that uh, dictum, it depends on who you ask. 
So, you know, if I'm a former leader or member of the Aryan Brotherhood, the brand, and I say, well, you know, obviously the brand, um, that would apply to back to the 70s. But um, I think in every group, um, you know, one of the most uh, difficult men I ever fought was um, um, Black Panther. Um, you know, and I've fought pretty much all the groups uh, at, at one time or another. So, yeah, to my way of thinking, you have to break it down to the individual. You know, um, So with, with, with that with, with that fight with the Black Panther, then how mm -hmm. did that how did that start? Well, that was in Old Folsom, and um, uh, we were fighting with. At that time, I wasn't even a member of the brand, um, but I'd been in an altercation with um, the Black Panthers' leader Hugo Yogi Pinnell, and we'd gone head up. And uh, as a result of that altercation, I had subsequent altercations, and. Um, I think the thing that um, is important about that is that they were one on one. It wasn't a, a group type thing. It wasn't, you know, uh, three guys coming up on me or otherwise. Initially, um, that was the case. But uh, we came to an understanding that if we were going to do this, that it was going to be head up one on one. And um, his name was Larry Justice. And um, hell of a fighter. Hell of a fighter. Are you able to take us through that fight? Mm, not really much to tell. I mean, when you go out to the old Folsom Yard back then, you had gunners that were 50 feet up on a wall. And, um, you know, you met each other, you squared up. The key to staying alive in old Folsom back then, because um, they don't do warning shots, and you're using an M14. It, um, it's a pretty hot round, but it was developed in World War II as a sniper rifle. So the idea is, is that typically when you're hit with it, it'll pass through you. And um, the point in when it was developed was that when an individual sniped somebody, somebody would come out to help that person because they were still alive. And then they get have somebody else to snipe also. But in the prison context, um, when the shots begin, you realize that the key to survival, to staying alive, even when you're fighting, um, is to move. And so it becomes um, very much a dance. And so it depends on how well you dance uh, in the course of that fight. And it, you reach a point where you understand that if you continue, um, you're, you're both going to die. And so you realize that, you, you take what you have relative to the fight itself, and um, you stop there. And that was the case with Larry. So it's like playing a game of speed chess. Mm. The, the clock's yes. gonna, the clock's gonna go, and you, you're, gonna, you're gonna, you're not gonna exist if if they shoot you down. Um, shots are being fired, and and because you're moving, um, usually what happens is the, the rounds are are hitting next to you, hopefully, and so that that's blasting asphalt up into your legs, so you're aware of that, but you're still moving. And the thing is, you have to stay focused on what you're doing because your opponent has a knife. So that if you're looking up at the guard, anticipating being shot, you're going to get stabbed. So it's a matter of concentration and staying focused on what you're doing and maintaining that dance for as long as you can. I just want to say something to the viewers about what John Abbott said to me. I, I played badminton with John Abbott on Monday. He was supposed to come on tonight, but he had a mm. family situation. And he said, um, for the people that are, you know, the, the minority of people that are challenging Mike and his story, and, you know, anyone who's seen the four podcasts we've done with John Abbott on this channel knows how real he is. So John Abbott said, put it this way, I was just trying to survive the mix. Mike, Th Mike Thompson was at the center of the mix. <laughs> so you can't, you can't get a higher um, salute from somebody than that. Well, I like John, you know, John's an old convict and so he understands and he's speaking from experience. Oftentimes you get people who take issue with the events I've been involved in and that's, um, you know, based on their experience and that experience may not e extend into, you know, the, the prison environment and particularly being in the mix, not just trying to avoid the mix and it makes a difference.
So, um, you know, it becomes, um, I think, oftentimes critical to understand that. You know, I don't take issue with those individuals who say, oh, geez, he couldn't have done that. He couldn't have done this. And I understand they're speaking from their experience. And so it just doesn't resonate with them. And that's OK. Um, you know, I don't have a problem with that. I don't take issue with that. Um, the thing that I always point out is that um, the thing about the Department of Corrections is that whenever you're in a knife fight um, or in an altercation at all, it's documented. And those documents are public domain. Anybody has access to them. So that, um, you know, you're not going to get the details uh, in a 115 rules violation report or an 837 incident report. Uh, you're going to get the officer's observation of what he observed, and particularly if he was firing a weapon. And oftentimes they were. There was I can't remember an altercation ever being less than eight shots fired. Um, sometimes many, many more. So, and, and even when you're hit with those shots, uh, that's not necessarily documented. Um, although you do go to the hospital and uh, if you hopefully survive it, um, you know, you have that medical record. But um, no, it, it, you know, I, under, I understand with a lot of people, it's, it's a bone of contention. And um, like I said, I don't have a problem with that. And we thank everyone for their comments and questions and views. So, Mike, with that fight you just described then, were you or your opponent stabbed or shot? No, we both hit, um, well, yeah, stab, not necessarily. Cut, yes. Oftentimes in your fights, depending on the type of weapon that you, you fashion, um, there's two styles of fighting. Um, you can attempt to stab each other or you can attempt to bleed each other if you have time. Typically in a situation like that, you don't have time to bleed each other. So it's a matter of, of getting whatever strikes in that you can in the course of that dance, avoiding being shot. Sometimes you don't do that successfully. Um, oftentimes it's enough just being hit by the shrapnel. And I have a lot of shrapnel in me. And you know, when they take x-rays of me, um, oftentimes medical personnel marvel at the amount of shrapnel that is in me because it actually blocks the x-ray because it's lead and uh, so you see that um, perhaps i should acquire a copy of that somewhere and post it people might find that interesting so it sounds like you had this intense focus during these fights but was there a fight situation whereby you thought this is really getting going against you and, and you, you th you're thinking the worst might happen no, I've never been in that situation other than with guards. When um, you had an outfit at Corcoran called the Sharks, the Green Wall, and at one time I was chained and subject to a beating. I think I've already told the story, but uh, the only thing that saved my life, I was choking on my own blood, was to spit the blood at them and tell them simply, is that all you got? And that stopped them. But um, that's the only time I can recall where I actually thought that this might be it. Um, but in so far as my fights with um, other prisoners, I've never been in that situation. You're not really thinking about that. Uh, you're focused on what you're doing. Of course, you go to the yard with the idea, if you're going to be in a knife fight, that mm, you're probably going to be shot and you could be shot and killed. But you're, you're not going to allow yourself to think about that because that's going to get in the way of what you're doing. If you're anticipating being shot, you're not focused on what you're doing. And so you have to block that out. You have to compartmentalize it and, um, and deal with what's at hand. What led to the situation with the guards that you just described? That was, um, I had, uh, well, actually I was testifying in, in a case up in Oregon against, um, uh, members of the Hells Angels, they had um, assassinated Margot Compton and her two six-year-old daughters, as well as her boyfriend. And uh, it was a renegade move. It was not sanctioned by Sonny. And, and you know, I've heard people say, oh, Sonny didn't talk to him. Uh, Sonny's an old friend. And I know he just passed away. Again, rest in peace. But um, that was not something that Sonny sanctioned. Uh, whatever else can be said about Sonny, um, he did not condone killing children. Uh, in, in any capacity, and certainly not in the way in which this was done. So it was a renegade move. I was testifying up there. 
Simultaneously, an inmate had been killed at Corcoran. He was shot in the head by a guard. Um, by my estimation, it was a murder. It was investigated by the FBI and the Department of Justice. Eight guards were indicted. They anticipated that I was going to testify against them. I didn't. But uh, nonetheless, that's what they anticipated. So this was their way of uh, demonstrating to me that they did not want me to testify. So that some of that perhaps ties into this next question then from Heisen Blue. Do you mm. still consider the rivals that you had on the inside to be a current threat to you? Um, that's a great question. You know, I, I guess I don't. Um, you know, people often ask me, you know, who are your enemies? I don't have any enemies. Um, I don't look at it that way. Um, I've made my decisions to do what I do for my own reasons. Uh, that's based on what I perceive to be my personal integrity. And there are always going to be people who take issue with that. How they take issue with that is beyond my control. So I don't think about that. I just simply um, maintain my preparedness and um, live my life. So we've got a John Abbott clip that went viral. It was Hell's Angel Assassin in, I think it was San Quentin Prison, Doug the Thug Or. Did you ever come across him? Yeah, I know Doug. He's since passed over. I think he overdosed from heroin while he was still in. But he was at San Quentin with me. And, um, you know, a force to be reckoned with, as many of your Hell's Angel members are. Um, you know, nothing in what I talk about relative to any organization is an attempt on my part to uh, demean them or um, lessen um, their standing within the organized crime community. And Doug was one of those individuals. Um, kickback, but knew his stuff. You know, he was instrumental in bringing the um, uh, Hell's Angel bike shows to San Quentin, you know, which was unheard of. So it uh, was demonstrative of his influence um, within the prison itself. And he did have that influence. But like so many other pers people, prisoners, um, in San Quentin and elsewhere, uh, Doug was um, a heavy heroin user and her heavy methamphetamine user. And um, oftentimes that impacts a person's capacity to function. And um, that would be true of Doug or anybody else that was in the mix using. Did you see Doug in action? No, Doug was on the main line. <clears throat> Excuse me. Doug was on the main line. And I was in the adjustment center. I went back and forth from uh, the shelf to the adjustment center. The adjustment center was just the overflow for the shelf. And um, so the only time I would have seen Doug or anybody else was um, when I was taken out and about, or, you know, you could meet with individuals by way of the ducat process, and it's one of the things that we controlled within San Quentin was uh, all clerical work and, you know, the, the clerks themselves, so that if I wanted myself ducated to a particular location, say I wanted to meet with Doug or anybody else, I could and did. Um, but insofar as seeing him in action, no. All right, next question pertains to the Italian Mafia, and hopefully at the turn of the hour, we've got one of my friends uh, is going to come on, join the stream for about 10, 15 minutes, ask some questions. His name's Bruno, who was an enforcer for the Italians in the, in the Arizona jail back, back with me in 2002. But I'm curious how the Italian Mafia are treated in the California state system, prison system. And this question is asking whether there was any business interactions with the Italian Mafia, and I imagine the AB. Yes, but mostly in the feds. Uh, first and foremost, how the um, Italian mob is treated within the prison system is with respect, uh, because uh, they're probably the hierarchy, if you will, of organized crime. And uh, you have many organizations who attempt to um, fashion um, themselves after the Italian Mafia, by way of example. Um, when you're in the prison system, you're, you're dealing with a different infrastructure as opposed to on the street. You're not using guns. At least for the most part, you're not using guns. And the dynamic is completely different. 
Uh, the violence, violence can be just as brutal, if not more so, in prison as opposed to the street, and uh, certainly not as swift. But um, within the prison system itself, you know, uh, the brand did have some dealings with uh, Gotti and others by way of uh, protection. You need to understand that uh, in the prison system, uh, you have organizations like the brand who control that prison. So that means that uh, if protection is needed, then it's usually provided um, on those terms. And um, that's no different than um, bodyguards is really what it comes down to. There, have, there was some discussion about picking up contracts um, on the street um, through the Italian mob. But other than that, you're essentially looking for resources. And, um, you know, whatever else is said about uh, the Italian mob or otherwise, um, we're talking about business. And, um, you know, that's, that's the issue here. Uh, your resources, your infrastructure, how you're generating those resources, how you're utilizing those resources as it pertains to your organization. So it's a business. Tying into that, then a question from Havacamp. Mike, would you be willing to sit down with Michael Francis on his channel? He's a former Italian mob boss. I know who Mike is. Sure, I would. Well, I'll just add to that as well. Mike is presently in the UK. He's doing a tour, and I'm hosting four of his shows in oh, Liverpool. That's great. Yeah, Liverpool, Manchester, Bradford, and Coventry. So if people are interested in that, just Google it, and you'll you'll find the tickets. All right, so here's a, here's a, a, light, a lighter question for you. Uh, how are you enjoying your freedom from Paul Johnson? You know, people ask me every day how I'm doing, and I say, well, I don't think I could be doing any better because I really don't. Um, you know, I'm living my life to the best of my ability. Uh, I maintain a positive attitude. Um, you know, it... Um, you would think that you want to do this, you want to do that, but you know the blessing for me, as first and foremost being with my wife, and um, you know having the opportunity after being together many years while I was behind the iron gates, and pursuing um, my release, but also pursuing our work with Live, Learn, and Prosper. So now we have that opportunity uh, to follow up on that. Um, there are times when it can be dangerous. Uh, but uh, she is like me. We tend to focus on the positive and um, we look at what we can do, not what we can't do. And um, so it's developing relationships. Uh, the real blessing for me is the ability to um, practice my ways and um, to be a servant. And I'm now in a position where I can do just that. All right. M. Coop has asked, What's up, guys? Can you ask Mike if he did time with Stanley Tucky Williams or any other well-known Crips or Bloods? Yeah. Um, Davidson, who was... Um, Mark Davidson, who was one of the originators uh, of the Crips. You know, and, and I'm probably getting, kind of going to get a lot of pushback. One of the largest men I've ever seen in my life. Huge. Um, and a hell of a fighter. But Tukey was uh, no slouch himself. He was a huge man and, um, you know, lifted iron, uh, was intelligent, um, did a lot of work. I thought that was um, um, beneficial to the public. Um, the tragedy, by my estimation, where Tukey is concerned, is that um, he refused um, to acknowledge um, the Crips as a gang and uh, as such um, forfeited his life. I think in many respects that took enormous courage on his part, but personally I wish he would have gone the other way and used the vast knowledge that he did have and the extraordinary t intelligence that he had um, to continue working with children and, and writing books and educating, you know, relative to what it is to be a human being and particularly, um, you know, how he came up. Um, you know, we're talking poverty, abject poverty. We're talking um, the things that uh, aren't talked about enough. You know, what it is to be black, uh, what it is to be black and incarcerated, and, and so on. There are a multitude of questions that come to mind relative to that. And Tookie was in a perfect 
position to address those. Um, I think to the benefit of um, his culture and his community, um, his ethnicity, um, to the um, benefit of a lot of people. So his, his loss in, in that context, I believe is tragic. All right, you're being asked here, and I know we touched on this in part one, you're being asked, if Tyler Bingham was Jewish, how did he come to lead the AB? Well, you want to remember that back at the uh, beginning of the Aryan Brotherhood, um, it wasn't about um, um, what people refer to as uh, white supremacy and the um, neo-Nazi context, the white supremacy, that type thing. Um, you know, you had individuals who were Jewish, you had individuals who were Samoan, who were Native American, who were obviously Irish and, and so on. Uh, so um, the issue back then was about controlling your resources. It wasn't about um, like many of the, there was no nationalism uh, associated with it. Um, you know, I believe that, uh, take TD again, that uh, TD is a patriot. Uh, I, I know many people in the law enforcement community that would take issue with that. But, um, you know, I consider myself a patriot. I'm an American and proud of it. And uh, there isn't anything I wouldn't do for this country. Um, but I am not a nationalist. Um, I'm not a white supremacist, never have been. Um, and I'm certainly never uh, thought of the Aryan Brotherhood as a hate group. They weren't. Uh, they were a group that was incarcerated that um, um, took advantage of the fact that uh, they had an opportunity to control their environment uh, by way of utilizing their resources towards generating revenues. Organized crime, yes, but um, still the context is within a controlled environment. Um, I understand that has since changed. I understand why it's changed. Um, many things in our society since the 70s have changed, and uh, the Aryan Brotherhood is one of them. Jason has asked about Wendell Blue Norris, Wayne Bulldog Lad, and Irish Murphy. Yeah, no, all three. Um, Wendell probably uh, more so than anybody else. Unfortunately, he took his own life at uh, Calipatria some years ago. Um, but um, hell of a fighter, hell of a warrior. And um, he is the one that actually... Uh, started um, the idea of Odinism behind the Iron Gates, um, you know, runology, the, the teaching of runology. Um, you know, I stood back to back with him many a time on the yard in warfare, um, uh, successfully. Uh, Bulldog Lad, um, um, great guy by my estimation, extremely intelligent. Um, was very much into the books, the law books. He had that association to his wife. Um, he since passed over. Um, who was the third person? Irish Shen? Irish Murphy. Oh, Irish Murphy. Okay, you're talking about uh, Dennis Murphy. And uh, Dennis um, was a barber at Old Folsom, spent most of his time on the line, uh, put in some work. I didn't really know him that well, other than I was in the hole and he was on the line so he was one of the resources that we used on the line to maintain our standing within old Folsom. next question is from claude how did you justify being an ab with your faith well it's not really a justification there is no justification particularly as it relates to my faith um it's one of the reasons that uh, i was moved to step away. I realized I was visited um, in the late 70s by some elders who brought it to my attention that I was raised differently and that what I was essentially doing was um, serving two fires, two truths, but they referred to it as serving two fires and that I had to make a decision. I had to choose that I couldn't serve two fires. So um, I made that decision uh, to step away from the brand and um, to serve the fire that I continue to serve to this day. So um, to answer the question, there was no justification. 
You know, I took the steps that I did for the purposes of um, controlling my environment. Um, I thought that was critical toward my survival. Um, it did facilitate my survival, but at the same time, um, put me in a position of, of constantly having to fight for that, uh, which I did. Um, so, um, again, you know, there, there's not going to be any effort on my part to justify nor rationalize uh, the contradiction there. It's, it is a contradiction, and it uh, is one that I had to confront at one point in time in the course of my journey and did and uh, made the decision to step away for that reason amongst others. Dylan's asked, is there an advantage to being a psychopath in prison? I suppose there is. Um, I've known a number of psychopaths in prison as well as sociopaths. And I know the distinction. You know, I make that distinction by the observation of individuals who would knock a man down, put a pencil in his ear and kick it into his brain just to see how he dies. That's a psychopath. So, um, You know, it, it was really an error on my part. Um, it would be easy to sell on my na naivete, and, and, and I suppose there's an element of that as it relates to dealing with the men that I was dealing with. But it was a hard lesson for myself in understanding that in many respects, that's precisely what I was dealing with, were psychopaths and sociopaths. You know, there are clinical terms for that. I've been accused of being both myself. Um, um, but certainly I, I don't meet the criteria, but I can understand why people would place me in that category. So is it in the interest of the gangs then for violence to be structured and used for the purpose of generating resources and money as opposed to just random psychopathic situations? Yes, violence, violence is actually currency. You know, it, it's the currency that you use to control your environment. And um, you use it uh, sparingly. Um, in other words, you don't allow fist fights in prison because that interrupts business. But when the business structure itself is, in, the perception is that it's infringed upon, um, then you have to, you can't bluff. You have to be able to back up what you're doing, and you're always going to receive challenges relative to that because you have opposing forces who want access to those resources. They want to control those resources. You're like dealing with a small city of 5,000, 6,000 people. And um, so, you know, who's going to control that is really what it comes down to. Have you got any stories of psychopathic loose cannons within your own race that you had to rein, <laughs> that you had to rein in? That's always the case. I mean, Steve Clark was probably a, a good example of that. Uh, uh, Steve was eventually... Uh, killed by uh, Clifford Smith in Chino. And um, as a matter of fact, he killed him right in front of myself. And um, while he was in the process of taking his head off, literally decapitating him, I stopped him. Um, you know, that could be perceived as, as uh, psychopathic. But Steve was one of those individuals that, going back to San Quentin when we were there, that... Um, Either I or I had to assign somebody to, we called it walking the dog. And um, he was so intent on wanting to create um, violence and havoc um, that you actually had to walk him on the yard and let him process, let him talk through that. Um, you know, hell of a fighter, um, but... You know, in the end, that didn't serve him. What had led up to the decapitation? He had disrespected um, Clifford in front of his daughter. Yeah, we were on a visit. Back then, we had uh, open visits out on the yard, and our families were allowed to come in. And uh, we visited with the Mexican Mafia out on the yard. And... Um, one day, one of these visits, uh, Steve had um, called Clifford a punk in front of his daughter. Um, so that night, uh, Clifford killed him. Wow. 
Guitar Storms has asked, does the prison system actively not try to discourage gang membership for new arrivals? It seems like you go to prison for two years and all of a sudden join a gang can get you 20 years. Mm, it's true. And it's a good question because um, for many, many years, what the prison system did was that it used the gang element to control the population. They knew exactly what was happening. So if they were having problems, for instance, with a particular ethnicity or population, they would go to the gang member and say, hey, we need this handled, we need that handled. And some gangs would do that, uh, particularly in later years. Um, so it, it's always been a problem. You know, the biggest problem there is the presumptions associated with um, why the gangs function and, and how they function. But um, uh, back then, particularly, um, you know, some of your guards were actually members of uh, the Aryan Brotherhood. So, and likewise with the blacks and the black, you know, the BGF and the Black Panthers, you know, your black guards were actual members. So it, you had to, you had to factor that in, and you had to take that into consideration. It's been asked about Mike Tyson here, but I'll, I'll try and make this question more general then. I know Mike Tyson was housed in Sheriff Joe Pyro's jail in Arizona where I was at. Um, but if a world champion professional boxer was on the yard and you had to fight him, Mike, I mean, is, is his skills going to come into play? If it's, a, if it's a knife fight, you're under pressure from the, the gun tower. It's a whole different realm, isn't it? Well, it is a different realm, but you're, you're asking a specific question about a specific individual. And it isn't that I'm all that knowledgeable about uh, Mike Tyson, but I do know this about him, is that he's a fighter. And he has an innate sense of, of, of um, survival. You see that in the ring. Um, by the same token, um, he's a gentleman. So that in, in the course of a knife fight, there's no doubt in my mind that... Um, and this is pure speculation on my part, that he would use his skill set uh, to facilitate that. And I think that um, what I do know about him, that he would do that effectively. So Thomas wants to know if there were any Irish or English-born guys that joined the brand. Well, you had a, we had a connection to Ireland. Uh, trying to remember the man's name, McDonald. Um, he was connected to an organization in Ireland and, uh, there was one point in which we were connected by way of, uh, gun running, um, associated with that. But, you know, many of your members of, um, the Aryan Brotherhood were Irish, um, <clears throat> thus the, the, uh, use of the shamrock, um, you know, oftentimes the 666 within the, the three clovers of the shamrock. Um, you know, it is said that uh, St. Patrick used the, the shamrock to teach the Trinity. So the idea of the 666 within that was to demonstrate an anti-establishment factor um, in that regard. So, um, you know, there were um, those who studied Gaelic that uh, studied, uh, you know, um, their Irish origins uh, associated with that. Um, so to answer the question, yes. Who was the person you feared the most? Myself. <laughs> um, I think that's always been the case. You know, the, the most difficult thing um, when you're involved in the type of combat that I was involved in is to um, maintain your own code. You know, I've often talked about the fact that I was never required to take life because of my skill set. But there have been times um, when that was challenged uh, by the circumstances. And, um, you know, I've never entered into um, combat angry or with my emotions out in front of me. Um, so, um, fear, we all, I don't care who you are, we're all subject to fear. It's an innate characteristic. It's how you deal with that fear that makes the difference in pushing past it. Um, the more catastrophic events that you deal with in your life, um, the better your understanding 
of um, not only your mindset, uh, but how you're going to approach a subsequent catastrophic events. And um, within that is the idea of having to deal with fear. Um, so some people deal with it in different ways. But uh, again, to answer the question, uh, myself. You said you were sometimes challenged by the circumstances. Could you give us a story of such a challenge? Well, yeah, I was um, I was in Chino, and um, we had established a, a hierarchy by way of vote throughout the nation. And um, I was elected to a council uh, that was uh, intended to oversee the activities of the brand. And um, one of my bones of contention was the was drug use and the way that it got in the way of um, individuals being able to function. Um, as most of us know, addiction is a disease of the brain and it impacts a person's thinking. Um, so the offer was made that um, everyone should stop using drugs in the interest of the organization. In other words, if you were committed, if you were loyal to the organization and committed to its um, ideology, then uh, you would want to stop using drugs. Some took issue with that, and uh, some attempted to take issue with that violently. So I had an individual one day coming in on the yard on the tier, and um, he had his arms stuck inside the bar, and he was attempting to talk to an individual inside the cell, but um, something just didn't see seem right to me. So um, I caught it out of my peripheral vision that he had a knife in his hand, so uh, his intent was to stab me as I walked by him. Um, so I locked his arm into the bars, took the knife away from him, and uh, I put him down. And in putting him down, he begged for his life. And um, it was a choice on my part. Uh, so what I did was I choked up on the knife and I tattooed a series of wounds around his heart to remind him that he had been given his life. Um, you know, that's just many of one altercations in, in which I was involved, in which I had uh, a choice, uh, whether to take life or not take life. Um, and sometimes things can get pretty hairy um, in the course of combat. Uh, so the point I suppose I'm making is that you have to stay focused. And um, I was able to do that, and I'm grateful that I was able to do that. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. but It, it uh, does, but, but I've got another question. How do you stay so calm and focused during such intense moments? That's training. Um, you know, it's one of the ideas of uh, attempting to educate the public now about violence in general and preparedness. You know, in, in this country particularly, we're dealing with a lot of hate groups. Uh, but more than that, uh, we're dealing with a lot of um, crime on the streets, uh, violence being perpetrated against innocent people. And um, one of the things that uh, I intend to engage in is training for those people to contend with that. Um, you know, that's violence. And uh, don't get me wrong, there are times when violence is necessary. Um, I don't like it, uh, but the, the point is to be prepared for it. And so it's that preparation, it's that training. You know, I still train every day. Um, I said it before, I'm, I, you know, I'm still a student. I'm still learning. Um, that will be a lifelong endeavor. But um, I would encourage all people, all citizens, no matter where you're at, um, to embrace a sense of awareness as to your environment, the potential violence in that environment, especially if you have children and you want to protect those children, or you have loved ones and you want to protect them, or you simply just want to protect yourself. Um, that um, it's in your interest, and it's kind of unfortunate, but it's still in your interest in this day and age um, to prepare yourself for um, any outcome. What kind of experience would you have had if you decided not to affiliate with the brand? And do you regret any particular decisions behind the walls? 
Well, you know, when you talk about regrets, um, that's a difficult one because you're engaged in uh, survival. And uh, regrets require emotional intelligence. And um, I'm lacking and have been lacking for decades in emotional intelligence. And um, so that um, requires experience, experience that I don't have and that I'm just now learning, as a matter of fact, with uh, the help of my wife and, and others who assist me in, in um, what a development on my part that was arrested uh, many decades ago. So um, as it relates to regrets, it's, it's hard to contemplate what that might be um, because everything that I did, I was caught up in um, the course of survival. Uh, once I left the brand and began uh, my journey toward uh, educating the public and um, the challenges became different. And um, I would uh, be disingenuous if I said that in the course of uh, cooperating, for instance, with law enforcement, that I didn't have regrets about um, um, certain paths that I took toward that. Um, it was like when I f was first arrested in my commitment offense. You know, I thought that all I had to do was go into court and tell the truth. It doesn't work like that. Uh, that's not what justice is. And the same is in dealing with law enforcement. For the most part, the vast majority of the law enforcement uh, personnel I dealt with were, were good people and uh, obviously believed in what they were doing. But you had those that were corrupt. You know, there's no, no simpler way to say it. They were just simply corrupt. And um, so they put me and my family in harm's way. Um, so whenever I have to contend with the idea that I um, placed my family in harm's way through my association with what were supposed to be um, law enforcement, law-abiding members of law enforcement, then um, yes, I have regrets. Uh, but for the most part, um, Regrets on a personal level, um, as I said, I'm, I'm devoid of that emotional intelligence, I think, required to process that. But I'm currently doing just that. What books did you enjoy the most while inside? Well, there are a lot of books. I mean, I'm a biologist by training, and my education was in biology. Um, I know people will think that it's... Um, you know, this philosophy or that philosophy. And, and, and of course, I, you know, I enjoyed Sun Tzu and Masucci and, and um, even Friedrich Nietzsche, although I don't respect or admire him as a human being or a man. Um, nonetheless, uh, he was ahead of his time. But, uh, you know, in the field of biology, you know, E.O. Wilson immediately comes to mind. Um, he's um, a biologist. Uh, at Harvard University that deals with ants and um, has done enormous, he actually wrote a book on human nature uh, that I think is phenomenal. Um, and, and there are others, um, you know, Church comes to mind, um, you know, Vanderkolk comes to mind insofar as his work on trauma. Um, number of people, um, you know, it, Oftentimes the discussion turns towards, uh, you know, uh, those individuals who are philosophers. And, you know, philosophy deals with the human condition. And um, I have my own take on the human condition. And uh, the thing I understood about reading books in general, and I've read thousands of them over the years, is that a book represents somebody else's knowledge. And it's fine. And uh, I, I love listening to them, um, depending on who they are. And what they have to say and um, but I still understand that's their knowledge so my quest my journey has been to acquire my own knowledge and uh, employ that uh, in the course of my own journey other than the blood spitting incident what was your worst experience in jail Well, bar none. The worst experience for me, and I think for many people, is the idea of being locked in a cage. Um, it does something to the human psychic. Um, you know, there's a term in zoology that um, refers to the capture of a wild animal and placing them in a cage. 
Um, it's called zoocosis. And uh, that's where a wild animal, again, is uh, captured and, and locked into a cage and then subsequently dies. It's because that animal cannot contend with the idea that it's in a cage. And so um, taking from that, in the course of my own work, I coin, coined a term called um, pencosis. So that's penology and um, penitentiary and, of course, zoology insofar as the psychosis associated with that. And so it represents the state of mind that the human being is subjected to in being placed in a cage. So uh, bar none, um, that is the most difficult experience that uh, I've ever had to deal with, is the idea of being uh, locked in a cage um, and contending with that. What was the deepest, darkest hole they ever put you in? Um, I have the dubious distinction of having been placed in the, the old dungeon at Old Folsom. You know, the old black strap iron with just a hole in the floor. and and um, But, um, you know, the strip cell was where I spent most of my time in Old Folsom. And that's just a hole in the floor. And um, by my estimation, you find out who you are. You know, I've been asked the question about uh, how my membership in the Aryan Brotherhood um, was at loggerheads with my spiritual walk. And indeed it was. Although, you know, four other natives and myself used to stand out in the yard as members of the Aryan Brotherhood and, uh, you know, tap our chest to get a heartbeat and sing our songs. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, the first rattle I ever had inside prison uh, well, not inside prison, but in the hole, um, was they used to serve half a grapefruit. And so I would uh, I would save the grapefruit halves and I'd put them up in the air vent and let them dry, strip the pith from them, uh, wait for an apple to come, dry the seeds, uh, pull the lining out of my boxers, sew the two grapefruit halves together with the apple seeds inside and uh, wrap paper around it, burnish it, and uh, braid it, and that was my rattle. Um, so it's about connection and um did i get lost in that no yeah. no no could, could you could you describe the hole in the ground i mean what what size what were you living in and like what was this was the sunlight coming in or what no no it's a strip cell is they actually have windows but it's um it's they have plates that they put up to block the windows and 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 the window and the door and then you step inside that and then there's bars that run across the cell. So you're in total darkness. And uh, the only thing in there is literally a hole in the floor um, about 10 inches in diameter. And um, that's your toilet. And uh, typically you're in there, if you're lucky, with a pair of boxers. If not, you're naked. But um, if they're allowing you to um, go outside... Uh, oftentimes, you know, even back then they had what they called the dog walk. So that you would go from the strip cell to the dog walk, and that was just a fenced area alongside the yard outside that you walked back and forth in, which is why they called it the dog walk. Um, but that's where I met most of my uh, cockroach friends. And, um, you know, gave them names. And I've, I've had... Um, First one, as a matter of fact, was named Herman. And, uh, he was a big three-inch cockroach, and uh, he had quite the hiss on him. But, um, he used to... Um, I met him when I was shot, and, and my body was paralyzed, and I was laying in a strip cell, and they'd slid a tray underneath the bars, and I rolled over. It took me a long time, and I put my face in the, in the tray, and I ate. It took me about another hour to roll back over, and pretty soon here came Herman out of the hole in the floor. And um, I could feel his antennae coming up my leg, and he wanted the food on my face. And, of course, I was essentially partially paralyzed, couldn't lift my arms, so he got what he wanted. And um, after he got what he wanted, he invited friends. So as his friends arrived, I named them. But, um, you know, that's um, the extent of the hole in the floor. Um, what was the what what was the food? Well, 
Um, depends. You know, you got what they call juke balls, and that's where they take all the leftover vegetables from the chow hall and they puree them, and then they add a little flour to it, and they make balls and they bake them in the oven, and then they feed you that. For instance, you would get that for back then. You get juke balls every day for 26 days, and they're completely bland, but they keep you alive. And um, on the 27th day, they give you a hot meal, and then put you back on juke balls. And um, so, you know, when I first arrived at Old Folsom, I mean, it was like a restaurant. Um, but uh, once you're in the mix, that all stops. And um, now you're on juke balls. And, uh, you know, they, the intent is to bring your weight down, particularly if you're lifting iron and you're big, and I was. And, um, you know, I've, I've dropped as much as 70 pounds uh, while, while being in solitary confinement on juke balls. But, um, and then of course, if, if, uh, staff decides that they want to rush you, um, then they perceive that you're in a weakened condition, but you don't allow that to happen. You know, you, even if you're in solitary confinement, you work out every day, you know, you ensure, you know, that you're prepared for staff to rush your cell or, or, um, to contend with anything that may come your way. Which ties into this next question. When did the prison food really turn to garbage? Was that a function of mass incarceration? Well, yes, I believe so. I mean, it was, um, I think it came from an economic base. You had so many prisoners, you had to be able to feed them and didn't have the budget to do so. And, um, you know, part of generating revenues for that budget was to use the farms that they previously fed the prisoners with to, smet, to sell those commodities like um, butter fat, um, and uh, meats uh, uh, to the public. So they would take the revenues generated from that, turn that back around and buy processed foods and feed that to the population. It was cheaper to do so. Um, they were only required by law to ensure that you received uh, 2,500 calories a day. You know, hell, you can get that in a quart of ice cream today. But um, that was the intent. So, yeah, I think it was with the explosion of the population itself and the prisons that they simply didn't have the budget uh, necessary to continue what they had done back in the 70s and so far as food. So now everything became processed and um, it was much cheaper uh, to feed the, pop, fo feed the population that way. Terrible did, food. Did you encounter... Did, did you encounter... That's why... <laughs> that's Sorry. why i became a vegetarian same here did you encounter yeah. johnny cash in prison did you attend any of the johnny cash gigs no yeah you know the vast majority um i went into the hole in the mid 70s uh and stayed there uh for decades so um you know those things are uh, available to to prisoners on the main line and they had access to, you know, San Quentin had a lot of programs as did Folsom where people like Johnny would come in and entertain and that was allowed. And, um, but if you weren't on the main line, then you didn't have that. Um, you know, being in the hole, I think it was 1976, they first allowed televisions. And so they brought televisions, televisions to everybody, little 13 inch black and white televisions. And um, they gave me one but I'd never watched TV. So, um, I used mine as a chair, made a great chair. And, um, but uh, no, I, I never saw Johnny or any of the other, you know, Merle Haggard or any of the other entertainers that, uh, came into prison. No, um, Schwarzenegger came in at one point as well. Didn't he? John Abbott told us. Yeah. Um, Arnold came into San Quentin, uh, him and Frank Colombo. And, um, would have liked to have, um, you know, participated in that. In our own way, we did because we had iron. And um, uh, so Arnold was a pretty big guy. But as he admits, you know, most of his size would do, was due to steroid use. And uh, back then, we didn't have steroids in the joints. So what we had developed, we developed naturally. And I think as a result, uh, we were actually stronger. You know, TD, myself, and... And um, Dirty Red Thomas had what we called the 500 Club, 
were three of us that were pushing over 500 pounds on the bench press. So, and Arnold couldn't hit that. Um, but his friend Franco could. Franco was amazingly strong and uh, did a lot of strong man feats, but Arnold was not a, a strong man um, for all his muscle. I think, you know, most he was pushing at that time was uh, high 400s somewhere, 480 somewhere in there. But um, not attempting to take anything away from Arnold, but um, I think Franco was the stronger man. <laughs> What exercises did you prefer in your workouts back then? Well, while we had weights, while we had iron, we pushed iron. And, um, you know, we uh, utilized uh, yoga and I utilized dance in conjunction with that uh, because it keeps you limber, keeps you agile. And uh, the problem that you have when you're developing your body, particularly along the lines back then, um, you know, at one point I was at 310 pounds and was pushing a lot of iron. But the problem with all that muscle is it gets in your way, um, particularly when you're attempting to um, engage in combat. You know, when your chest and arms are so big that you have to swing around your chest to connect with somebody, that's a problem. So you realize that almost immediately. And um, in my case, I, I, um, I dropped a good 50 pounds um, just to be able to um, enhance my movements. But I've always danced and um, I've always engaged in some form of uh, um, yoga or Tai Chi or you know something along those lines uh, to, to maintain my Chi associated with that, my flexibility. And um, so it's, you know, you do calisthenics also, you know, when they took away the iron, but uh, then you have to become inventive. So. From, in my case, it was just uh, continuing to focus on my core. Um, and in that, I used bear medicine. So, you know, bear crawls and, um, you know, different things like that. You, you put yourself in a situation where you're crawling up over obstacles on all fours so that it utilizes all aspects of your body in some capacity and stresses those. So it deals with your core strength and maintaining that. And are you still maintaining the Tai Chi? I'm still a, a student of Aikido and, and uh, Tai Chi and yoga, and uh, I still work out every day. And um, so, you know, I'm, I don't weigh anywhere near what I used to. I'm just a shadow of my former self. But um, I still maintain my weight over 200 pounds. And, and uh, so now in my 70s, the idea is agility, balance, and speed. Um, and uh, that becomes critical to... Uh, my continued survival. So Andy's asked, how feared were the AB and also were you feared? Um, I think the AB was uh, feared um, as a force to be reckoned with, you know, as a, again, the currency that uh, the brand used, like uh, most other gangs, was violence. And so that, um, I think, um, fosters fear. And that's the intent, actually, is to foster fear. Um, was I feared? I doubt it. Um, you know, most of the men that I engaged um, didn't engage me because they were fearful. They engaged me because they wanted to take my life. And that's a little bit difficult to do from a, a um, position of fear. Although I must say that, you know, interestingly enough, in my opinion, most violence is um, facilitated by fear in some capacity, but that's that's a process that you have to break down relative to the motive of the individual. Um, but um, no, I, I, you know, I've seen fear in the eyes of my opponents at times, but that usually was at the point where they realized they were losing. And, um, you know, that's very recognizable. But, um, you know, I know I was hated, you know, I had, uh, who is now an old friend of mine, uh, Tahari. Uh, he was with the Black Gorilla family and he was in San Quentin with me. And, you know, he used to tell me that they would, um, they had an artist, artist rendering of me, my face, and they made copies of it and they passed it around to the members of the BGF and they used to tape it up on the wall in their cell and they'd roll up their mattress and put it underneath my face and they'd practice killing me. And um, so, you know, I don't think that was out of fear. I think that was out of um, their intent. 
um, to gain access to me as warriors. Um, you know, and years later, uh, Atari and I were um, in the same cell together. And as I walked into the cell, he looked up at me and, and of course we recognized each other and he smacked his fist and he said, man, I used to hate you. And, um, and he did. And, uh, you know, that was his own um, indoctrination. You know, that there's a form of um, brainwashing, if you will, uh, with any organization um, that uh, facilitates that individual's commitment to the organization. And uh, we see that a lot with the hate groups today. Um, you know, oftentimes if you ask people what their beliefs are and why they believe it, they can't tell you, but they can give you the, the party line, so to speak. And um, that's sufficient for them. And, and that's unfortunate. When you saw violence, like the man nearly decapitated in front of your cell, did it affect you psychologically? You can't allow it to. Um, if you do, it um, hampers your ability to function. Um, obviously, I was moved by what was happening because I stopped Clifford from taking his head off. Um, but you can't allow that to stay with you. You have to compartmentalize it. It's called stoicism. And um, in my case, I utilize stoicism to its extreme in order to function. Um, I'm not a violent man by nature. I'm actually a gentleman um, and I deplore violence. Um, so you have to come to terms with that um, in the course of what you're doing and for the purposes of your survival. So stoicism becomes critical in that, in that you do not allow yourself to be touched by events, whether it's the decapitation of somebody or a pencil being kicked into a man's brain, whatever it may be. Um, and that too is part of survival. Could you explain in particular for the UK audience then what keistering means, why things are keistered and what would be keistered? Yeah, a keistering is just simply secreting an object in a body cavity, your anus. Um, you know, that cavity for most people is approximately six inches and then it turns into the uh, large intestine, the colon itself. And the reason you do that is that um, you need to get, say you're going out to the yard and you're going to be in a knife fight. You have to have a way to get that knife out there with the guards, without the guards uh, detecting it. Um, back before they had metal detectors, you just simply keistered a knife, you went out to the yard, you brought the knife out, and you got and you engaged in your knife fight. Um, then they brought metal detection in, so it became important to um, be able to beat the metal detectors. So I was able to do that. But uh, keistering is, is it's called uh, going to the safe. Um, and so that when you put something in the safe, that's to avoid detection by um, law enforcement personnel so that you can uh, do whatever you're going to do, whether it be a knife uh, or otherwise. Um, another form of, uh, it's not keistering, but um, I developed the technique of having a handcuff key. And a handcuff key has a little ring on the end, and you tie a piece of um, dental floss on that. You let a little blood, you coat the blood on the dental floss to give it color. You put a loop in the dental floss, attach it to a rear molar, and then swallow the handcuff key. That way you can reach into your mouth, grab hold of that dental floss and pull it out of your mouth for the purposes of coming out of your cuffs. And, um, you know, that's not really technically keistering, but it's a form of, of such um, insofar as using um, an orifice um, to secrete um, contraband or a weapon. How um, have, do you have any stories of convict justice on child predators and murderers in prison? Well, there are a lot of those. Um, you know, when I was first incarcerated in the jail, um, was my first real introduction to um, pedophiles and child molestation and child brutality. Um, there were two Marines at that time that did... Uh, it uh, killed a, a, an infant, um, tragically. Um, any killing of an infant would be tragic, but in this particular case, these two Marines were 
um, left to babysit the infant and the baby uh, fouled its diaper. And so their way of contending with that was to take the diaper off and hold the baby under the hot water, uh, the tub. Um, but in doing that, they were scalding the child and it was screaming. So in order to get it to stop screaming, they started hitting it in the head and killed it. Um, so mm, I dealt with them in the county jail and I dealt with them violently. I'll leave it at that. Um, and I've had other encounters. Uh, uh, a child molester will not last on the main line or even in the hole. They have s uh, special units that are set aside for them. And, um, you know, in later years when I became a counselor, um, you know, I had uh, groups that I ran that uh, were specifically for sex offenders and uh, child molesters particularly. And... Um, very, very difficult to deal with. Very, very difficult to listen to them process. And uh, their justification and rationalization in so far as their molestation of children. Um, so ultimately, I found that it was something that I could not do. Uh, that it would take a person other than myself uh, to continue that. Um, and in that, I developed my own opinion about um, uh, the disease of child molestation. I don't believe that it's curable, um, unfortunately. I wish it was, uh, but I don't believe that it is. Which ties, so, in, which, which ties into one of our mission statements on this channel, which is to end the war on drugs and mass incarceration and use those resources to go after predators and lock predators up for longer. And I was, I'm sorry to interject there, Mike, but I was going to also ask, if, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think about chemical castration well i mean that's i think an interesting question um i think that if you're not going to chemically castrate an individual and even if you do that that isn't going to stop them from their predaceous activity uh, chemical castration i mean we're not just talking about um, the idea of um, an individual satisfying himself sexually Oftentimes, that is, isn't even the case, um, you know, um, sexual gratification. So chemical castration, um, I think, doesn't go far enough. Um, you know, by my estimation and in my opinion, um, if you're not going to impose the death penalty, which actually I don't believe in, then um, I think uh, lifetime incarceration in a facility um, that um, attempts to contend with um, the disease that these individuals suffer from is appropriate. Um, you know, Europe is, is way ahead of the United States in its um, incarceration, its attempts to incarcerate. But uh, I know that here in California, for instance, there are facilities that house nothing but um, pedophiles. And that uh, they have, um, you know, these are way out in the country because they can't be around anybody else. They have their own security. And, um, you know, I don't believe that it's humane just to simply lock somebody away in a cage and leave them there. Um, I think even with pedophiles that there's a humane way in which to contend with them. And that uh, whatever is required to protect the public, that uh, that should be done. Um, and if that means life without the possibility of parole, um, then I'm not opposed to that, as long as they're treated humanely. And uh, that wouldn't require putting them in a cage. Um, it would require creating an environment for them in which they can live out their life um, as human beings. Just going to ask the viewers then a bit about this. Put a one in the chat if you think chemical castration should be introduced. Put a two in the chat if you think that chemical castration is inhumane. Be curious to see what the viewers think about that. On a much lighter note then, let's go over to this next question, which is, what did you do immediately upon your release from the big sentence? Well, I was um, 
was put in a van from uh, receiving and release. It was processed out at, at receiving and release and put in a van and, and driven over to a parking lot that um, was essentially a train station. Uh, but my wife met me there at that parking lot. And uh, it was um, <laughs> amazing. I mean, you, you just, one moment you're in a cage, the next moment you're not. <laughs> and you're standing in a parking lot and you're looking around and um you know there's there's nobody standing there saying uh you know you can uh, briefly kiss your wife uh, but no excessive contact no this no that go sit there you know suddenly i have um unfettered access uh to my wife and to the world around us and um, so the, my wife is uh, extremely spiritual like I am. That was the foundation of our relationship from its origins. And so what my wife and I did was we gave thanks um, to a great mystery and all our relatives and uh, all our relations. And um, we spent some time doing that. You know, we smudged me off and got all that prison off me. <laughs> and uh, then we um, we got in the car and and uh, we went and got something to eat. And um, that's why I wake up every morning grateful to this day still. Um, you got to tell us what you ate. <laughs> Sushi. I ate sushi first time and um, really enjoyed it. Um, my wife is Japanese. And uh, so, you know, I wanted to, um, you know, honor her heritage and uh, our celebration. Um, and so uh, we did. And, um, you know, then we went uh, shopping for some clothes and, uh, my goodness, I had no idea. Uh, you walk into a um, clothier, and it, it's like a warehouse. You know, we went to this place called REI, and uh, it deals with um, outdoor clothing. Um, so, you know, it was a matter of. Um, I remember at one point there was somebody that tried to get me into skinny jeans, and I said, I don't think so. Uh, that's that's i mean for those that you know that's great for the you know the younger generation but um um not not for me what is the story of you disbanding the nf members at tracy well <laughs> a lot has been said about it and, and dispatch was the word that i used and, and so there's a a great play in the media upon my use of that term. But, you know, it's been overblown a, a lot and I understand why. Um, you know, it was not the Nuestra Familia that uh, I encountered. What had happened was that um, I'd worked for the chaplain there, Chaplain Leon England. And uh, back then it was against the law to practice our ways. We couldn't engage in Native American spirituality behind the Iron Gates. But he was a very progressive chaplain. So in exchange for me taking care of the chapels, he gave me the garden in between to practice my way of life. And it was my practice to go out there with my eagle fan and my small drum and my rattle and dance and sing. And um, the priest with the Catholic chapel uh, apparently associated uh, my fair features and uh, my practices with devil worship. So um, he had complained to members of the Nuestra Familia who... Um, solicited members, parishioners of the Catholic Church. These were just guys that, look, <laughs> they actually taped the knives into their hands. That tells you a lot right there. But they were not warriors. They had never been in combat before, probably never been in a fight. And they pushed seven of them out the door to combat me in the garden. Uh, it was like a Keystone Cop episode. Um, I did put them down. It was not that difficult. You know, and, and anybody that understands the fundamentals of Aikido know that you're dealing with multiple opponents all the time. Um, 
and that's how you're taught. But uh, this was not a challenge. And uh, these were not trained assassins, you know, that were defeated. Yes, there were seven of them. But, um, you know, it was like those Disney characters, Goofy and, and uh, you know, uh, Daffy Duck and all. I mean, it was just, it was ridiculous. And, um, you know, I felt bad about the extent to which I hurt them. Um, really. Uh, because... You know, in the minds of the Nuestra Familia, these parishioners were expendables. They were put out front like that because um, no regard was given to their welfare or otherwise. They were forced to do what they were doing, and uh, so their heart wasn't in it. And um, uh, like I said, the best way to describe it is a, a Keystone Cop episode. You know, I've been in other altercations with multiple attackers, um, you know, that were trained. To an extent and, and didn't come out of it uh, unscathed but came out of it nonetheless and you know those are other stories but people say oh he didn't do that and he didn't do this again um, you're speaking from your own experience if you're contemplating that in my opinion um, the most important thing here is that it's well documented and anybody has access to it um, you know it's it's not something that I'm proud of it's not something that I say you know um, oh look at me and uh, I certainly don't put myself on a level of um, Bruce Lee. You know, I'm not that guy. You know, I know how to fight and uh, have fought and um, have survived. And that was just uh, one circumstance uh, in which I did survive. Uh, and I'm grateful. I think people are really fascinated by this story. So I'm just going to ask a few more questions. When, when seven of them come out at you like that, how do you decide which one to go for first? I didn't. They came out a side door, which was a huge door. I mean, it was the door's four feet across. But they came out in what I would refer to as a flying wedge. They had a point man, and then they came back in a wing. And um, so you had a point man and three on each side of him in a V-shape that came through the door. And um, I had heard the door being keyed, and that was highly unusual. That door was never keyed. And so it it alerted me and I'd been dancing so I just set my stuff down on my prayer mound and I moved toward the door as it opened and as it opened they come busting through and the point man I immediately struck him and when I struck him I spun off him into the windows of the chapel and the rest of them just kind of faltered out into the yard falling over each other because I, I dropped him right where he stood and so um and while they were confused and disorientated and in disarray, and they were, believe me, um, like I said, they had these damn knives taped in their hand. And uh, the shanks were made from uh, the instep of boots. The boot factory was at that particular institution. And so, you know, they were just drawn back, points on, on each side. So they had maybe a three-inch blade sticking out of their hand. None of them ever used a knife. That was obvious. They didn't know how to, nor did they want to. So it was just a matter that while they were disorientated and disarray, I moved amongst them and put them down. And it was not that difficult. It did not take that long. Um, but that's how it came about. Did that disorientation come from your reputation preceding you and you employing the strategy of cutting off the head of the snake, the, the point man? That came naturally. That was as a result of my training. You know, I was trained by my elder for years in martial arts. And, um, you know, my practice, if you will, was I, I rode the rodeo circuit as a bull rider. And um, I was a young man. And uh, as often would happen, uh, if I bested them in the bull ride, which I often did, that night we were all camped around the, um, the rodeo arena. And usually there were olive groves. And so, you know, these cowboys, they get liquored up and they suddenly had uh, taken it upon themselves to uh, take issue with the fact that I'd bested them in the bull ride. So we would fight. And sometimes there would be more than one, sometimes two or three. But these are drunks. These are cats that are liquor liquored up. So, um, you know, that was my introduction. Now, the difference there is that, you know, you're. <laughs> I can remember knocking men down and telling men, look, just stay down. Just stay down. You know, and um, these were not coordinated individuals. Um, in truth, they couldn't whip their way out of a wet paper bag. I've used that term before, and I, I mean it. Um, but 
you know, that, that gives you the experience, but also your training gives you the experience. Now, was I prepared when I came in prison for the shift, if you will, in the level of violence and the intent associated with that? Not really. I had to adjust to that and I had to adapt. But one thing that uh, I am good at is adapting. So with my training, what we're talking about here was second nature um, because of my training. And that's why I emphasize preparedness on the part of anybody that that is concerned about violence, that they, they engage in training, that they prepare themselves in whatever capacity they can. So that when a catastrophic event, and that certainly had the potential to be a catastrophic event, um, when they're encountered by that, that something within them allows them to combat it. In my case, I was fortunate. One that I was dealing with, again, the Keystone Cops, um, because in truth, had it been trained assassins, I'd probably be dead. Could you give Too us a story? Could you give us a story of when you did bump heads with trained assassins and some damage was done? Excuse me. Yeah, I've I've been in um, quite a few knife fights, and um, you know, the people often ask about uh, the knife fight with uh, Yogi Pinnell, and uh, it was just that. I mean, you know, Yogi. Uh, attempted to recruit me into the Black Panthers, and people were, oh, you know, Black Panthers, they need to get over that. You know, again, if they just go back and do the research and look at the facts associated with the Black Panthers and who they recruited and, and so on, um, they'll see that, um, um, that that conforms to their ideology. But at any rate, um, Yogi was Nicaraguan, but he was the leader of the Black Panthers in Old Folsom, and he attempted to recruit me because he'd heard about the altercation at Tracy. And he recognized uh, the fact that I'd been raised native. So in his recruitment process, he gave me this spiel about the, you know, the Communist Manifesto, and I'm American. And, and when I declined his offer, that's what I told him. You know, I was not astute as it comes to understanding what communism was, you know, because I was still learning how to read and write then. And so I, I, I did not have the mindset. I did not have the intellectual um, footing. Uh, to understand what he was telling me. He was way beyond me. So I relied upon something that John Wayne once told me. And, um, you know, where my elder's ranch was located was near the Irvine Ranch, and John Wayne oftentimes worked that ranch when we did the spring roundup. And he had a lot to say about communism, believe me. And so I simply said to Yogi, you know what? John Wayne told me that communism is bad, so I'm going to go with that. I'm an American. And my answer is no. And Yogi said, well... He said, uh, he called me Young Mike. He said, Young Mike, he said, uh, if you're not with us, then you're against us. So what you need to do is you need to go in and make yourself a piece, and I'll meet you out here in the morning. I said, okay. And I went back to my workout. I went in that, that afternoon. I spent all night making myself a knife. Um, you know, I was trained in knife making. Another thing my elder did with me, I was familiar with metallurgy, the whole thing. There's a longer story that goes with that, but I'll cut to the chase here. Next morning, Yogi and I met. We met head up. He had a knife. I had a knife that I had made. He'd made his knife in such a way as to stab me. I had made my knife in such a way as to cut him. But we both understood that we needed to move. You knew that instinctively because we had three gunners on the rail. So we began our knife fight and we began our dance. And there came a point when he understood that he was losing. And I saw the fear in his eyes. And when that happened, he ran. And I chased him like a damn fool. Um, so I encountered two of his bodyguards and I ended up in a knife fight with them. And in the course of that, I took a round from a, a, a mini 14 in the back. It lodged next to my spine, but it put me down. And, um, you know, there was a lot of controversy over that because Yogi called me out yet when he understood that he was losing, uh, he ran and, and by the convict code, um, that was, um, unheard of. You just didn't do that. So it actually created a split between the Black Panthers and, and the BGF, uh, who were in some aspects aligned with the Black Panthers and, and um, their ideology. So, but uh, that also meant that I had to meet head up others in that capacity and did that quite a few times. And, um, you know, it uh, <laughs> there's a lot that goes along with that. But, um, you know, again... Um, you know, people question that. Go in and do your research on Yogi. 
You know, unfortunately, his life was taken by the brand in New Folsom a few years back. Um, you know, this is a man that I highly respected, um, not only for his ability, but his intellect and his commitment to, to what he believed. Um, and, you know, even after that, I saw him years later in Corcoran. And um, he was cordial, as it should have been. And, um, you know, that's the thing. You know, when you're, on, when you're on the battlefield and you know you're on the battlefield and you handle your business, when you're not, then there's no reason not to be respectful and not to be cordial. And to my way of thinking, in keeping with that warrior code, that's what warriors do. Uh, you don't talk out the side of your neck. You don't jack your jaw. Um, as far as I'm concerned, inferior males do that, and usually out of fear. Se several people have asked, and just that one story does, I could see that as a scene in a movie, but several people have asked, who would you like to play yourself in a movie? I have no idea. I really don't. I mean, I, I don't watch, I never watch TV. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, my last year that I was incarcerated, my wife insisted on buying me one so that I could uh, um, acclimate myself to reality, she said. And I watched it and I said, if this is reality, I want no part of it. Um, these so-called reality TV shows and otherwise. It was way beyond um, my understanding of what society had been. But uh, movies, you know, she insists that I watch movies with her. And um, I've gotten to the point where I can enjoy some of them. Um, you know, uh, in being subject to the condition of post-traumatic stress disorder, oftentimes I'm triggered. Uh, in some of the action movies that I see. And, um, you know, we'll be watching a movie and there'll be a fight scene and say she has her arm around me or on, on me in some capacity. She brought it to my attention that with the fight scene, my body's moving, you know, with the moves that are being made. And, um, you know, that's, that's a, a natural process. Um, I, I think, at least it is for me. But I have no idea, um, you know, who I would want to. Uh, I'll let others decide that. And, um, you know, should it come to that, uh, the actor himself decide that. Do you have fight scenes in your dreams? And if so, does that cause your physical to move? Uh, according to my wife, I do. Um, you know, and, that, and I do move. So, um, you know, obviously I'm dreaming uh, about uh, engagements that I've had. And so I'm reliving that. And um, so those, um, those, those movements do occur. Um, just have to be careful that, um, you know, I insist that she wake me when that happens because I don't want her um, injured, of course, as a result of whatever I'm going through. Of course, yeah. So quite a few people are asking questions about um, Native American beliefs. So we've got mm -hmm. one from we've got one from Extreme Cleanup Solutions. I'm a little mm -hmm. confused as to why he grew up on an Indian res. Um, did I miss something? And but he claims not to be native. And then the next question is, how can a white man practice Native American beliefs and eventually become a leader of the AB? Mm. Well, I was raised native, you know, my elder that I, uh, that I said that uh, growing up on the reservation, I had family that lived there. Uh, that's the short answer relative to that. So I, I went to live there, you know, in that capacity. It's not the, you know, I refer to myself as an old res dog. That's because the reservation was abject poverty. You know, you had tar paper shacks and, and small little 12 foot travel trailers and um, starvation and alcoholism and everything else that goes along with abject poverty. So, uh, you know, that was not a wonderful experience. But I went at the age of 12 from the reservation to live with my elder. And that was an Arabian horse ranch and ran black Angus cattle. So it was a completely different thing. Um, but he was half Nez Pierce. And he was actually the one that taught me my ways. So, you know, we traveled throughout the United States at gatherings. And um, so that's what I mean by being raised native um, in every way. Um, you know, how that uh, translates to becoming a member of the Aryan Brotherhood, again, 
go back to the idea that the Aryan Brotherhood was not a white supremacist organization. Um, the whole reason I joined the Aryan Brotherhood was because four other natives approached me and told me what it was really about. Um, three Pitt River brothers and one Maidu brother. And, um, you know, that resonated with me. So, you know, the practice of my ways, um, you know, I'm oftentimes asked about my blood quantum. Um, blood quantum is something that was developed by the federal government relative to uh, the designation of a tribe that would be recognized by the federal government. Um, you know, I understand it. I don't agree with it. Um, and um, I, I won't go so far as that to say I don't care because I do. Because there are a lot of natives who suffer today because they're not recognized uh, relative to that blood quantum or federally recognized as it relates to the federal registry. But the point for me is that because I was raised native, I'm native in my heart. And um, that's what's important. Um, you know, and I follow that to the best of my ability. So, um, you know, I practice my ways every day. You see some of that behind me. Um, these are my medicines uh, associated. This is exactly where I sit to do just that. Um, you know, this isn't a prop or anything. Um, you know, what you see behind me are gifts that were given to me by elders in some capacity. You know, I've been involved in this my entire life. When I was in prison, you know, I built sweat lodges. I ran sweat lodges. Um, you know, I had so many medicines in my cell that I could fill a cell, but I gifted all that away. You understand that some of these things that come to you aren't meant for you. I don't hoard them in that capacity. So um, it's like anything else. You know, if, um, you know, I don't consider the Good Red Road a religion, it's a way of life. And, uh, you know, I grew up with that way of life. It's the one that works for me. And um, so regardless of my fair features, I know I don't meet the Hollywood stereotypical um, image of, uh, you know, an Indian. And I tell people all the time I'm not interested in being Indian it's a Christopher Columbus term that was uh, given to uh, native people. You know, he was um, he was a slaver. And so uh, to me, Indian is actually, or could be, or should be a derogatory term. You know, natives, native people, you know, regardless, you know, when you hear their names, whether it be Anishinaabe, whether it be a Lakota, Cheyenne, whatever it is, it translates in their language to the people sometimes the principal people. And that's all it means. Um, you know, the one exception would probably be my do, which means man. But nonetheless, um, you know, they're talking about the people. And you'll have many tribes who will adopt others into their tribes. They don't give consideration to their ethnicity, their origins of birth, you know, their heritage. That's irrelevant. It's whether or not they have the capacity as a human being within their heart to walk the good red road and in that serve their people in whatever capacity that they can. Um, and that's what's important to me, to be a servant in that capacity. I hope that answers the question. Definitely. Stephen wants to know what you think of the modern day AB and Jason wants to know what does the AB spend its money on? I wouldn't know what they spend their money on at this point. Uh, you know, back in my time, the idea was to utilize it to develop a legitimate business, um, but also to provide for the families of the members uh, to ensure that they were taken care of. You know, whether you're talking about uh, prior membership in a gang or present state, um, as it relates to dealing with um, people who suffer from addiction or who are gang dropouts or whatever, the one thing that's always overlooked our families um, and the community in general. But um, back then, the idea of using the money was to uh, take care of the families, make sure they were provided for, as well as the members inside, to create legitimate businesses um, as a front for organized crime. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to sanitize it, um, but that was the intent. Um, today, um, it's hard to say. You know, it would be speculation on conjecture and conjecture on my part, um, you know, to even go there. You know, I would assume in its assumption and only that, that it would have a lot to do with drugs and the, um, 
um, sell of drugs and trafficking of drugs. There's another one. Who are the main enemy of the AB? That would be the Nuestra Familia, the Black Guerrilla family, um, the Black Panthers, uh, the Texas Syndicate. Um, and again, it depends on who you ask. Um, so um, you have a multitude of groups now within the prison system. And um, now that the brand is back out on the main lines, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that they're back in control. For many years, decades, as a matter of fact, they were locked up in security housing units. And so, you know, those individuals on the line had pretty much free reign and, um, you know, utilized that in whatever capacity they could and, and did. I hear a lot of stories about that. And the stories even to me are uh, interesting. But um, now that they're back on the line, there's no doubt in my mind that they control the lines again and the resources associated with that. So. Uh, for those that are living with behind the iron gates now, it um, it's not easy being under the um, control of gangs as well as the Department of Corrections. Did you mentor youngsters coming in and give them advice on how to survive? Yes, I did. It's, um, you know, I taught people how to fight, how to make weapons. Um, you know, talk to them about... Um, essentially a warrior code of conduct, um, you know, and I didn't just limit that to um, members of the brand, um, but to others. Um, now, you want to remember that um, I was a youngster myself, and so, you know, there was a lot for me to learn, but uh, by my estimation, I wasn't going to learn that from uh, individuals who were also members. Um, you know, my standing was based on my physical prowess. And so um, I was in good standing as it relates to that. Beyond that, uh, once I learned to read and write, then it was a matter of, of um, you know, reading others and um, acquiring that perspective as to what I was reading and then how to interpret that if I was going to emulate it um, to do so and then monitor that. And in the end, if I was going to make it my own, then do so. But um, it becomes important to understand what you're doing and why you're doing, particularly when you're talking about self-efficacy, self uh, which is just another word for self-mastery. And that, that to me is a lifelong endeavor. Matthew has asked, are other current or past former members of the AB as personable or charismatic as you you are very open and willing to talk about anything and everything. Are there other members that hold the same values, ethics, morals, and principles as you? I think some do, um, you know, in their heart of hearts. You know, uh, right now they're caught up in just what I was talking about before, the idea of stoicism and what you have to stuff by way of survival. And then, of course, you have those that are completely committed to what they're doing and believe in it wholeheartedly. Um but I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. Um, and I think it's important um, towards my own sense of identity um, to exemplify um, those character traits that I think are important as a human being. And I attempt to do that. I'm human, so I make mistakes. Um, fortunately, I have a wife who is um, very astute. Um, and will not hesitate to point out to me when she sees, um, you know, me going one way or the other. And, you know, because I lack experience, life experience, you know, it's um, understandable to me that I may have that tendency. And so she'll rein me in very quickly and say, okay, we have a discussion. Did you think about this? Did you look at this? I said, well, you know, as a matter of fact, I didn't, but I'm glad you brought it up. So what about this? So we have discussions, intelligent discussions. And, um, you know, I have a reasonable intelligence, but um, um, in truth, my wife is brilliant. And uh, I'm blessed to have that available to me. Question from the desolate one. Having left such a violent organization, how do you cope with threats to your life now as an ex-member? By staying prepared. You know, I'm going to live my life. I'm asked that question a lot. Um, you know, I'm not in the witness protection program. 
I don't advocate. I don't challenge. You know, nothing in, in what I said is taking a position against anybody. I stand for something. You know, I don't stand against anything, but I stand for the principles that, that you'll hear me discuss relative to what it is to be human. You know, what we need to look at by way of incarceration, our judicial system. You asked a question about child molesters. You know, I wasn't anticipating that, but, you know, I was required to answer that honestly. And um, fortunately, I have that reserve uh, to do so. So, um, you know, it's just a matter of being uninhibited um, in how you approach life. Um, and, and I try to do that. Liberty wants to know what are the biggest changes to the power structure in the last decade? Will it survive amid such diversity through the prison system? And what is the end goal, end game of the AB? Control. Short answer to the, the, the last part of that question. And, um, you know, do they have an agenda as it relates to, you know, the various hate groups that you see throughout the country? Um, will they utilize them in that capacity? There are elements or factions, if you will, of the Aryan Brotherhood that certainly will. Um, primarily because of their membership. You know, there, a lot of them are ex-military, ex-special forces. Uh, the Aryan Brotherhood faction that they belong to is a paramilitary group. And so they, like others, unfortunately fancy themselves patriots, but they're actually nationalists. And there's a huge distinction to be made there. And uh, so the end goal is to advance uh, their ideology as it relates to hate, um, and the subjugation, you know, of others to that hate. Uh, and they typically do that for the purposes of control, unfortunately. Um, again, you know, that's, you know, it's a subject that uh, needs to be, be addressed more. You know, more questions like that need to be asked. Um, and then answers given, you know, based on the intelligence that's out there, you know, relative to law enforcement and otherwise. You know, to my way of thinking, there should be town halls about a subject like this um, because it puts the public on notice as to, you know, what they're dealing with. You know, those individuals that are being paroled back out into society, you know, um, is the public at risk? Yes, they are. You know, is law enforcement doing everything they can to contend with this? I think they're doing the best they can right now, but they certainly need more resources available to them in order to facilitate that. You know, domestic terrorism is um, really what we're talking about here. And, you know, whether we're talking about um, people being shot down in schools or in churches uh, because of their ethnicity or because of their ideology or because of their religion, you know, you want to put the Aryan Brotherhood in that category. Um, and again, you know, even with the AB, I'm not standing against him, but I'm standing for that which it takes to combat that. Counter know, it's, not a subtle, it's not a subtle distinction. Counterfeit has asked, is it a good strategy if someone checks into PC to avoid trouble, for example, extortion or anything else that might make that person do more prison time? Well, protective custody is, is they only have one protective custody unit in the state of California. And it has very few people in it. And, um, you know, um, so to go into protective custody, no, you can, you can go to another yard, you can drop out if you're in a gang, uh, you can go to uh, yards that uh, don't have gangs, um, you know, the structure, they, they, they developed what they call the sensitive needs yard, uh, SNY, uh, they don't work, um, because you're, what you have is you have people that come from these other, and they get to a sensitive needs yard, and they start their own gangs, and <laughs> and it's in the same process all over again. So you just have a subset of what they just left. Um, but, you know, the real key to dealing with any of this is education. Uh, on the part of educating prisoners, you know, giving them alternatives. The vast majority of them have grown up in poverty. They come from inner cities. Um, you know, uh, they're drug addicts. You know, it was usually drugs that led them into their life of crime or it was poverty or it was the color of their skin. And, you know, it's through education that they're given an alternative, you know, as to what it is to be a productive member of society. And believe it or not, 
many, many, many convicts, prisoners, would like to be just that. They don't know how. And all they need is an opportunity to be, to be shown how. They're just bloody commodities in the mass incarceration industrial complex. We've got a, a question from Adrian. How would an Irish man or Irish immigrant fit into the main prison gangs? How would they survive and would they be accepted? Yes, they would be accepted. And um, particularly is um, really a novelty. Um, you know, based on the fact that uh, they're Irish born and bred. And so they bring that um, pedigree, if you will, with them. And so that would be something that would be looked upon with favor, uh, particularly with somebody like the brand that, that, that uh, you know, brandishes the shamrock um, in conjunction with, you know, the big mistake the brand made, in my opinion, was they attached the swastika to that, um, you know, but that's them. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's about the best I can answer that question, I guess. What about somebody from Germany then? Well, it wouldn't matter where you're from. In Germany, yes, same thing, particularly given the, the status quo of the situation now. Um, you know, where you might run into a problem is if they're from um, or Uwanda uh, or... Um, West Africa or uh, Israel and so on, you see. Um, so European, you know, they're, they're probably going to be um, pulled into the mix in some capacity. Um, but beyond that, I mean, it's like any other hate group. You know, you're going to isolate. Uh, you're going to be, you're going to advocate that elite perspective, you know, of race, you know, associated with the fundamentals of that elitism. You know, that that's why we're having all the shootings that we're having here in this country. You know, 10, 14, 19 people being executed at a time um, by somebody who has been brainwashed, essentially. You know, that he's a youngster, you know, it. it it um, is really a subject that needs a lot more attention. Um, so far as how these things are able to happen, why they happen, what is the thinking of the individuals? Why are these youngsters so vulnerable? What are they looking for? These are all questions that should be asked and answered. Um, and right now, I don't see that they are. I see a lot of um, people offering their opinions, you know, from a, a clinical perspective. And I'm not saying that that doesn't have value, it does, but that should not be the basis upon which we address these issues. We've got a few people asking about Barry Mills and Tommy S. Have we touched on them yet? Tommy Silverstein, we touched on Barry. Barry, he was called the Baron, he's since passed over. Or the Baron, yeah. And um, not really much to say about Baron. Um, Tommy Silverstein, another individual that, uh, you know, became uh, infamous within the system for taking the life of a correctional officer in Marion, Illinois. Um, he was under escort in the shoe, went to a cell, came out of his cuff, received a knife, grabbed the officer and began to stab him. The officer's son, who was officer and officer, was on the other side of the grill gate. So Tommy pulled him up to his son and began brutal, brutally stabbing him in front of his son. And then in the end, um, it is said decapitated him. I don't know if that's true but I know that he did kill him. And uh, so he became infamous for that and uh, was put on lockdown, uh, no human contact, you know, um, uh, was quite the artist. Uh, you know, many of your individuals in prison uh, develop their creativity. That creativity, I have a theory on that relative to the use of certain narcotics that um, uh, triggers the... Um, cortex in the brain that deals with creativity but point is is that he was quite an artist but um, tragic tragic life um, I don't know what more what much more I could say about him than that hey mate we're at two hours and I don't want to I don't want to take up too much of your time these questions will just go on all night do you want to wrap it up here 
Well, I suppose we can, but uh, you know, with the provision, I suppose that we should make allowances for future conversations. If if people want to do that, I'm more than willing to do so. Um, I don't know how many questions you received, but um, you know, if people still want the opportunity to ask their questions or to weigh in on any subject, um, you know, my suggestion is is that uh, you know we set this up so that we can do it again. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm around for the rest of this month. Then I'm going on the road for a couple of weeks. So oh, yeah. perhaps, so so perhaps uh, we could do something next week if you're up for that. Sure, sure, we can do that. It's um, it um, you're never going to answer all these questions in in the course of a two hour podcast or a six hour <laughs> podcast or an eight hour podcast. But um, you know, along with the questions. Um, you know, if I've already answered the question, then of course, please, um, let's let's move on to other issues. But you know, I'd really like to know what your audience thinks uh, about the issue of judicial reform and and uh, the idea of of um, you know dealing with prisoners, uh, incarceration, putting an individual in a cage, cage, uh, the process of addiction. Um, you know, where they stand relative to the various issues that our society is facing. And I'm talking about our global society, you know, as it relates to hate groups, what they think about hate groups, what they think about the best way to address that, um, and so on. So, um, so, look, if you have questions about my spirituality, it oftentimes comes up, you know, I am a man of the people, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have relative to that. Um, you know, I have no problem singing you a song. I'll get up and dance for you. Um, <laughs> well, and that's what I want you to understand. Um, this is what I believe, and uh, there's a reason why I believe it. And so, you know, since we are going to close this, uh, you know, my prayers are with all your viewers and with you, Sean. You know, I, I pray that the, the power of creation continues to touch you with peace and love. And um, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for spending so much time with us, Mike. And for people watching this then, Mike's website, there's a link at the top of the description box below this video if you want to check his website out. He's prohibited from socials right now, but I'm sure they're going to get established at some point in the future. And he's also working on his book. So, you know, please keep up to speed on where the book's at. We've had loads of people in the chat tonight have been asking when's the book coming out? Is he doing a book? Blah, blah, blah. That is in progress. So... If you want to support Mike, please go down and check out his website link and you will keep an eye on that as well for, for the book. Do you, want, do you want to give him an update on the, on the book, where it's at? Well, yeah, we, we're just, uh, we're 10 chapters into it and we're actually, you know, we've got 10 more chapters to go, but we've got part one and part two. So we're trying to make the decision as to just go ahead and release the 10 chapters and work on the other 10 chapters and put that out as a second book. I'd like some input on that from, from your viewers if they have it. But insofar as the website itself, again, I'm not allowed access to the internet. I'm on here today only because of my studio engineer, Ken. And, uh, you know, that's through a court approval. But uh, I'm denied access to the internet, including my website, even though I'm the CEO. We're in court on that. So if you go on the website, you have some content on there. And you may become frustrated because there isn't enough on there. But uh, I promise you that uh, that will change in the very near future. Um, and... Um, you know, there you can leave whatever comments you like or weigh in however you like. And it's deeply appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, huge thank you to the viewers. The chat has been so lively tonight. Thank you for all your questions. Please like and subscribe. And if you want more stories from back in the day, check out our four podcasts with John Abbott and our four podcasts with Jamie Morgan Kane. All right. Cheers, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Let us know in the comments what you thought. If you've got any future questions, put them down in the comments and we will bring them in for part three so take care out there and most of all huge thank you for mike again for being so generous mm -hmm. of his time cheers take care everyone bye. cheers bye, -bye.